welcome Dr. Donna Peters. Well, thanks a lot, Lynn, and uh, I want to thank you all, too, for uh, braving the cold night and coming out for uh, the talk. I think, you know, I'll get into maybe or touch on some of that specific research that we do at MSU, but uh, what I want to do tonight is kind of go through a, a talk on uh, astrobiology and, and what we think about and, and how we use some observations on Earth to um, kind of drive and direct our search for uh, life beyond Earth. So let's start out with just uh, how many of you think there is life beyond Earth? Now, how about intelligent life? <laughs> maybe, maybe not intelligent life on Earth, we need fun to uh, So how long do you think it'll be before we find life elsewhere. Anybody have a feeling? Five years? Ten years? Three. Hundred years? Three years? Because maybe not if, if we're going to find, find life elsewhere. Because, you know, our ability to find or detect life elsewhere or detect signs of life elsewhere or remnants of life elsewhere is attached to NASA missions. And we have just these periodic opportunities. And there's one coming up, an experiment coming up, and I'll, I'll talk about that uh, later in the talk. Now, you know, our evaluation of the likelihood that we would encounter life elsewhere, we can, you know, we can liken that to some aspects of maybe looking for a parking place. We look for a parking place in MSU on an afternoon or something. You know, there's kind of, there's a few, tangible things, like we know how many parking places there are, we know how many permits the university police have offered up, but we don't, you know, there's some things that we can't get our head around completely, like, like, okay, the effect today, you know, a really cold day, then uh, there's a tight constraint on those parking places. If we had a nice powdery snow the night before, we may see more parking places because people have gone up and out. If the rivers are clear and it's a nice sunny day or a little bit overcast, uh, we might, in the afternoon, open up some parking places as well. So that, you know, the point I'm making is, you know, we have a search space. We know how many parking places will be. Um, there's some intangibles. I think that um, search for life elsewhere uh, we can also think about that along the same lines. And this is, uh, this is the famed Drake equation that was uh, really formulated in 1961, I think. It was uh, a Green Bank meeting in West Virginia uh, where uh, Frank Drake and, and others um, came up with this equation to evaluate the likelihood of finding intelligent life and intelligent life that could communicate. Um, and that's, you know, a lot of people attribute this equation to uh, Carl Sagan, even though it's called the Drake Equation. And I think that's just because, you know, Carl Sagan championed it, and he's so much more articulate than most other scientists that we want to, anything he talks about, we want to attribute to him. But what this equation, uh, what these variables in this equation, well, n is what we're looking for. That's the number of habitable planets that, again, would have life and intelligent life that would communicate. Uh, R is the rate of star formation. Uh, F is um, the fraction uh, of stars that would have planets. Uh, n, the number of Earth-like planets. And then F, uh, L, F, I, and F, C are the fraction uh, that would have life, uh, F, I, intelligent life, fraction that could communicate. And um, then L is the lifetime of a civilization. And so this equation and you know, Drake and his colleagues applying it to what we do know, which you know, obviously we can't get our handle on uh, many of these numbers very reliably, but making conservative estimates, uh, Greg estimated that we should maybe encounter 50 uh, 
communicating with civilizations in the Milky Way, in our galaxy. And that was the basis for um, listening. And that was an argument to establish some of these uh, radio telescope arrays. And this is the Allen array. Some of it was um, established from federal money, some from private money, the Allen money. Uh, there were significant uh, contributions of private money to listen for intelligent life. And maybe some of you remember uh, you used to be able to download a screensaver that you could help process some of this data coming in. Uh, that you know, if you weren't using your computer, your CPU could actually be processing some of this data. Now, we have a lot of interesting perceptions of what life could look like elsewhere. And you know, some of our perceptions are friendly life, some of our perceptions are things with like ET with long necks, we're kind of projecting evolution the next get longer and longer with the intelligence. <laughs> we have some that are, uh, you know, like E.T. or the Sesame Street Yip Yip guys that we think of as being, you know, relatively harmless. So then we have other guys, like here, this guy from Aliens, or I don't know if you remember this guy, Mars Attack, I don't know that maybe aren't so, so harmless. And, you know, uh, I think it came to the fore in the spring whether we're, perhaps we're not as ready as Whip Ripley is here <laughs> to, for encountering life that maybe is not all that happy to see us. And so in the spring, I think it was in April sometime, um, Stephen Hawking, <laughs> Stephen Hawking, uh, he, he said that we may not be ready yet. You know, we don't know enough about the kind of life we might encounter and the life might be hostile towards us. Life might be like Nero here from the new Star Trek that, you know, he's just really mad. And he's ready to go off on, um, on people from Earth. Or, you know, alternatively, they can be ready to sit down at the board table and just uh, talk turkey. Now, I think, you know, NASA, uh, we were at a NASA meeting, NASA astrobiology meeting at the time when this uh, Hawking report came out, and NASA's response was actually from this astrobiology meeting, and, and their response was that, you know, we are still interested in, in life elsewhere, and that we have no reason to believe that, you know, we're going to encounter hostile life elsewhere. And also, our search in NASA is much broader than the search for intelligent life and maybe even perhaps more targeted towards uh, simpler life. And by simpler life, I mean like microorganisms, our simplest life on Earth. And we have a lot to learn in terms of providing the basis for the search for life elsewhere by studies of the extent of simple life on Earth for defining a zone of habitability. So NASA is interested in studying life in extreme environments on Earth to establish a zone of habitability and a zone of habitability that we can use to frame NASA missions for the search elsewhere. So life in extreme environments on Earth, some of them you may not really recognize I haven't quite got this remote thing figured out. Know. There we go. Extreme environment. And I'm not talking about this life. I'm talking about the microbial community that lives inside a cow's rumen. This is one of the extreme environments. We depend on oxygen atmosphere. We respire using oxygen. Oxygen is an integral and an essential part of our metabolism. But that's not true for all life on Earth. And so the rumen of a cow has an ecosystem that, um, that where the organisms, they metabolize completely in the absence of oxygen. And many of these uh, require an anaerobic environment or dependent on an anaerobic environment or an environment devoid of oxygen. The 
organisms in the remnant of the cow that have metabolized cellulose with the cows are going to eat grass. Cows can't, the cow's metabolism really can't eat the grass. The microorganisms metabolize the grass. And then the cows live off uh, some of the microorganisms byproducts, but a lot of the uh, biomass of the, the microbes. And you know, in cows, the, one of the major end products is, is methane, methane gas. You also see, also see uh, methane gas in anaerobic plants. Now, this is a strange slide. <laughs> but actually, this, this is a, a professor of microbiology at Rutgers University. And what he's illustrating is the Volta experiment. And the Volta experiment is you take a funnel and it's attached to a tube. You pinch close to the tube and you stir it or you um, actually, you stir the sediment with the tube being open, and stir. It, and I think you know he's in pretty deep water, so he must be here stirring sediment with his feet, collecting the gas in the, the funnel, and then he pinches that close, and you can actually uh, open it again in the presence of a flame and ignite the methane gas that's accumulated in those sediments that's captured in those sediments. And you know, really, the uh, the bottom of a, a pond, there's a lot of organic matter. It's kind of it's a really happy place for microorganisms. It's kind of like the bottom of your dishwasher there. There's, there's a lot of microorganisms uh, that flourish and produce as an end product of metabolism of microbial community. Lots of different microbes uh, produce the methane gas. Uh, another extreme environment on Earth is like extremes of uh, high salt or, or hypersaline environments. Organisms that can live at a really, really high ionic strength. We know we can't live under high ionic strength. In fact, I don't know if you, uh, some of you maybe are watching these shows so I can say, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, I shouldn't be a lot of shows. <laughs> And you know, a lot of those are, uh, you know, like somebody that's trapped in the ocean. You know, they, they capsize their boat or something like that. And, you know, they're dehydrating in a big pool of water just because of the ionic strength. Now, there's some environments on Earth that have much, much higher ionic strength than seawater. That's about 3% uh, salt. This is a picture of the Great Salt Lake and the northern and southern arms of the Great Salt Lake. And you can see here, uh, this, this arm of, these two arms of the Great Salt Lake are separated by a 30 foot uh, train truss. And on one arm, there's a uh, much higher input of fresh water than the other arm. The Great Salt Lake is, a, is an example of a terminal lake, a lake that has input but no output. So dissolved minerals input into the lake, but there's no, they don't get diluted, they don't leave the lake. And so, here in this arm, you can see it's a darker color. This has a higher rate of input than up here in the top. And this is about 13%, 13% salt, which is much higher than seawater. But this other one, where we see it's a lighter color, is actually more than 25% salt saturation. Very high concentrations of salt. And it's really lighter in color because of the microbial growth, because of the growth of microbes and live are the same pigments due to that color. And so it's really high productivity of microbial uh, growth in an environment that's really hostile to us. And so you know, one, one reason is that they do flourish and they're able to use uh, the nutrients that are available in this high salt, be able to tolerate the high salt. But since other organisms can't tolerate the high salt, they're not raised away. So you know, they predominate in those communities because nothing's there to eat them. And you can see a close-up here, and this is still the Great Salt Lake, and this color is due to light harvesting pigments. But you can also see that it's really not so friendly to other life. Uh, very cold environments on Earth. We have a really uh, very active Cold Regions Research Program at Montana State University with the work of uh, John Criscu and Mark Skidmore and others. And these are some slides that I borrowed from John Criscu. And uh, this is some of his recent work. 
in uh, these uh, Arctic coastal fall ones. So this is uh, here, here. Up here, you can see bear at the top of Alaska. And so these are uh, lakes. The blue is, is small lakes or ponds that have been exposed by the fall. And you can actually see methane and detect methane by them under these. And this is a, this next slide shows a sampling venture here. But you don't want to get too close to the edge of this without a, a sled or something. But, uh, sampling for uh, growth of microorganisms. And in these cold regions, uh, microorganisms uh, can tolerate these and even uh, thrive. And this is another, this is the Antarctic. This is the South Pole now, and Lake Vostok, which is uh, subglacial. So we see liquid water that's beneath this ice sheet. And this liquid water can even get below our, what we know as the freezing temperature, like zero degrees. And uh, this is under pressure, and with some ionic strength, you get a freezing point depression. And so you can uh, detect life here, so life even below zero degrees Celsius. High temperature environments. So this is a uh, a few black smokers from hydrothermal vents, mid-Atlantic ridges where uh, the plates are actually separating. And so you have a lot of heat at the surface and very sulfide-rich, mineral-rich water, water that's uh, superheated water that's moving through this rock, uh, very mineral-rich water that's really uh, very <coughs> good for the growth of microorganisms. So microorganisms can thrive in these environments even to the point where they can support eukaryotic organisms. And so there's, uh, in these very high temperature environments where organisms are living at the boiling point or even over the boiling point because we're at high pressure. So to high pressure, we can have liquid water at excesses of uh, 120 degrees where we can see microorganisms that survive, and isolate microorganisms that not only survive, their optimal growth temperature, their happiest at 120 degrees Celsius. Now these, um, all the sulfide bubbling up, the organisms can use that for energy. And these organisms, these are tube worms. You can find tube worms and clams and shrimp in some of these environments. And the way these tube worms work, they're kind of like a cow at the bottom of the ocean. They have, uh, they create an ecosystem for these organisms that can use the sulfide for energy. And the tube worms themselves live off those microorganisms and live off the microbiomics. Even on nearby Yellowstone National Park, I think this is the, the most interesting place uh, for uh, extreme microorganisms. And uh, Yellowstone is very interesting. This is a uh, very large number of thermal features and uh, water bubbling through all kinds of different rock. And so that gives you a really a broad spectrum. You know, you have temperature gradients which, that come from the effluence of these thermal springs, but also depending on the rock types that the superheated water is bubbling through there, you have uh, a large range of pH from very, very acidic, like pH 2, to uh, fairly basic, the pH in excess of 9, okay. and everything in between. And then all kinds of dissolved minerals, dissolved minerals that make a very happy place for uh, microbial growth. And so, you know, when you go to Yellowstone, you can see these thick microbial mats that come from some of the springs, and they have these colors. And some of these colors are from photosynthetic pigments, and some of the colors are from deposited minerals. If you, you have a gradient of temperature that's uh, coming from the source of a thermal feature, as you as the water cools, as you get farther and farther away from the feature, the gas solubility changes, and so oxygen solubility changes, and the water becomes more oxygenated, and that really affects 
the solubility of minerals. So all these colors we see are a combination of pigments from microbial growth and deposited minerals. It's like a rainbow or a red uh, uh, in these in the environments. And you know, one thing you may also notice in the Yellowstone is that you don't see, you know, if you look at the thermal feature, you have to see where the spring comes down a little ways, and then, then photosynthesis and uh, all these pigments start. So there's always, uh, in the hotter springs anyway, you'll see a region where you don't see photosynthetic mats in these green and orange colors, and uh, reddish and orange colors. And that's because photosynthesis itself has limits, upper temperature limit of 70 degrees, around 70 degrees Celsius. But live in Yellowstone, we can detect near the one 90 plus degrees, 100 degrees Celsius. And one of my uh, research thrusts in my research group, and this is Trinity Hamilton, who's a graduate student in my lab. And what she and, and some of my group are interested in is defining habitability or the extent of different types of ways that life gets energy. So different types of metabolism. In, uh, where, what are the environmental constraints of different forms of life? OK, these <coughs> latter environments, the, the hydrothermal vents, the mid-Atlantic ridges, and the Yellowstone environments, these higher temperature environments, many consider those environments uh, analogs of early Earth environments. And that's really based on our thoughts about what the early Earth was like around the time when life emerged. And as evolutionary biologists, we have a, a specific way of looking at the relationship of the evolutionary relationship between microorganisms that are present on Earth today. We use phylogenetic trees. This is an example of uh, an adaptation of that in historical linguistics that shows really the derivation of the word we know as snow. So you can see in these different colors, these are different clades. And these are different clades of related languages. And at the top here is an ancestor, a hypothetical ancestor, where as we get away from that hypothetical ancestor, uh, we get newer and newer languages derived. And the word snow derived from this Proto-Indo-European uh, word snig. Uh, we can also, in this case, we can probably imply some relationship to the environment. In that we would assume that the word snow would evolve in a place that would have snow. Well, we use a similar type of relationship to relate extant organisms or life that we see on Earth today. And what we use is a component that's present in all life. It's some part of our ribosome, 16S ribosome, RNA in the case of prokaryotes, the related 18S ribosome RNA in eukaryotes. And we can compare the sequence of, of those to be able to relate organisms or group them into clades and be able to trace their evolutionary trajectory. And so what this is, this is a tree of life here with three domains, Eukarya, archaea, and bacteria, with a hypothetical last universal common ancestor where the colors would meet there or at the root. Now things that are closer to the root are organisms that, amongst the organisms that we have on Earth, are more ancient organisms. And you can see, and I'm trying to make the connection with these hotter environments, these earlier analogs, that the types of organisms that we see closer to the root of this tree are thermophiles and hypothermophiles. Organisms that not only survive at high temperatures, but they, they uh, thrive and, and uh, require high temperatures to grow. Now, I'm fidgeting that. Now, our thoughts on the, the early Earth, you know, Earth 
uh, emerged as kind of a planet about four and a half billion years ago, and that's based on uh, some rock dating and based on um, uh, this is you get from the geochemist. But life, there's it's uh, not really known exactly when life emerged after the Earth became a planet. And you know, one of the predominant uh, theories on that was that life was limited, or uh, life as we know it uh, couldn't have started until after this late heavy bombardment, or uh, the, what's thought to be the rearrangement of these gas giants and outer planets that caused a lot of debris. And this occurred on the order of maybe 4.2 to 3.8 billion years ago, and that's dated by uh, impactors on the moon's surface. And so some people think that late heavy bombardment was enough to, uh, enough impactors at the surface of planet Earth to create high enough temperature that anything that was alive would have been exterminated and uh, extinct, and then we would have had to start all over. I just was at a talk last weekend at, at Arizona State where um, the geochemists from the University of Colorado Boulder argued that the late heavy bombardment really just uh, heated up the earth a little bit more and made a really happy place for earth to or for life to proliferate. And his idea was that maybe life started before that. Uh, for dating life. There's a number of different ways that that's approached, and, and they use very unique biomolecules that persist in the rock record. And the oldest evidence for life, indirect evidence for life on Earth, is about three and a half million years ago. But there's a general consensus that when life started on Earth, that the Earth was warmer than we know where to be today. And that life emerged in maybe a, a primordial soup. We have uh, small molecules, gases, hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, CO2, other gases that uh, were in liquid water and heated liquid water. And those underwent chemistry to assemble the building blocks of life. In, in the late 50s, there's a set of experiments to actually examine this idea. And this, these are the famed miller urea experiments, where uh, this is Stanley Miller, and he was a student of Harold Urey uh, at the University of Chicago. And what he did was he took some gases, hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, methane, uh, mixed them together, in uh, liquid water, in a closed environment, in an anaerobic environment. We know the oxygenation of the Earth didn't come until uh, a long till later, the advent of oxygen photosynthesis. We believe life emerged in an anaerobic environment. So he tried to recreate these conditions in a sealed system and used uh, a spark for a source of energy. And he was able to show that from these small molecule precursors, he could make building blocks of life. Now, you know, this is an interesting story with Stanley Miller and uh, Harold Geary. Harold Geary is a Nobel laureate, and he's actually from Montana and uh, studied at the University of Montana. There's a lecture hall at the University of Montana that's named after Harold Geary. And he was also a, a teacher in, in Livingston. And I'm not sure Harold was so excited about, you know, his Nobel Prize wasn't for these experiments, and I'm not sure how he was, how invested he was, and so the, the experiments were uh, more historically associated with Stanley Miller. Now, all these things together, we talked a lot about, you know, I talked about, I started this discussion with the extreme files and the origin line, sort of framing this that we study these things to create a basis or uh, to establish a zone of habitability for a set of environments where we observe life on Earth. And really those, when I talked about those extreme environments, like extreme cold and extreme hot, I said, well, you know, we can actually see life below the freezing point. As long as we alter water in such a way that it's still liquid water below what we normally perceive as the freezing point. Or we can observe life in 
very hot water or even the, above the boiling point, but it's only in like high pressures under conditions where water is, uh, where water won't boil, it's under high pressure. So really liquid water is a really key element for where we see life on Earth. And liquid water for a chemist and a biochemist, you know, liquid water really dictates the structure of all our biomolecules and how they assemble themselves in a cell. Because cell membrane, essentially, these are molecules that interact, they're made up of molecules, phospholipids, which have part that interact well with water and part that don't interact well with water. And so when you make a mixture of these molecules that have all this polar and water-loving and water-hating character, those water-hating parts, they aggregate, and you can spontaneously form a bilayer membrane or a micelle, a barrier. And so our biomolecules and our organization of the cell really dependent on water. And so water has really been an emphasis in NASA's uh, exploration for life, both in our solar system <coughs> and considerations beyond. Now, with regard to our solar system, there, and, and this is probably the part of the time where you know, if you're in an astronomy club, then um, you may probably know more than I do about some of these things. But I'm going to give it my best shot because I'm going to relate it to the things that I talked about in terms of establishing the zone of habitability and, and water. And so what we're looking for in our solar system and what we're looking beyond our solar system in terms of uh, our quest for finding life elsewhere. So within our solar system, we're mainly interested in, I think there's some interest in Mars, and I'm going to talk about that, and then moons of Jupiter and Saturn. And so what we know of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, the, the details are from these Cassini, uh, Cassini and Galileo Fibon missions. And so for Saturn, there's a couple of moons of interest. And so, Saturn has a number of moons. Uh, one of these, Titan, has been of interest to uh, NASA. It has a, a special character, and, and there really wasn't known, that much known about the surface of Titan until this Cassini uh, mission, because Titan has a pretty dense nitrogen atmosphere. Okay? And so much of it once the surface was obscured, it's a, a, a planet that's composed of rock and, and water ice. And at the surface, it has liquid, not liquid water, but liquid hydrocarbon. And it's really the only satellite uh, other than Earth where we know that there's liquid at the surface. It's liquid hydrocarbon. Or, uh, you know, that's, in my mind, is why it gets not as desirable, perhaps, as water. But if I think out of the box, you know, water, the interactions with water, we have productive and non-productive interactions that, uh, um, really dictate the structure of our biomolecules and, and cell structure. If we just turn our cells inside out, maybe why not uh, water or hydrocarbons? And some hydrocarbons actually have a large enough liquid range to um, perhaps lend some credence to this idea. Um, again, the surface, and this is a rendering of the surface of type liquid, but liquid hydrocarbon, not liquid water. Now, this is, one of the, this is the largest moon of Saturn. One of the smaller moons, Enceladus, I mean, this is a, actually, my son said, how did I do that picture? <laughs> <laughs> so I think this is Cassini sort of superimposed on the surface of Enceladus here. And so, uh, Enceladus, it's a, a silica plant with a rocky, uh, <coughs> a, an iron core, but it has this smooth water ice surface with these striations. And uh, Cassini has on board uh, science imaging and also infrared and examining the planet uh, a number of years ago they detected plumes of liquid water actually emanating from the south pole of the cells. So uh, that the hypothesis then is that liquid water is actually close to the surface and some have estimated perhaps even within 10 meters. Uh, from the surface of Enceladus. And so liquid water, an ideal place to 
search for life beyond Earth. Now, this is uh, from Galileo. This is uh, uh, Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. And Europa is also a planet with a smooth ice shell. It has uh, thought had a similar um, to silica rock, iron core, uh, a smooth outer uh, water ice surface. And the, the smoothness of the surface, the, the, the idea that there is that that's either new or it's renewed. So uh, that indicates or suggests that there may be water, liquid water, beneath the surface of uh, Europa as well. Probably not as um, close to the surface. But here's a few other images of uh, Europa with these striations in the <coughs> orange color. And that's uh, thought to be higher uh, uh, mineral rich areas on the planet, or on the moon. Perhaps iron rich from the core uh, deposited uh, on the surface. So we've got two of these moons, um, Enceladus and Europa, that are uh, hypothesized to have uh, enough internal heating, and this internal heating could be either from tidal influxes or from radioactive decay of the core uh, to support liquid water and perhaps support life. Now Mars has been in the news uh, recently, at least within the last uh, year a couple times or a year or more. And uh, the surface, you know, Mars, the Mars rover has uh, been uh, making measurements a lot longer than we thought the rover would survive. And we've been making measurements uh, on Mars by uh, infrared spectroscopy from the Earth from, for uh, quite some time. Now, this is just a depiction of some infrared images from the surface of Mars. And this technique, uh, infrared spectroscopy, was used to detect methane on the surface. And this was a discovery that came out maybe, maybe it was a couple of years ago, that there was not only methane detected in the surface of Mars, but that that methane plume was dynamic over the course of a year. Okay, it changed. And so, you know, I already talked about life making methane as an end product. So one of the questions that arose, was, well, does this have, uh, is this biogenic methane or you can also have geologically produced methane. And so you know, the question was asked, well, is there water or the potential for water on Mars? And Mars does have these polar ice caps or exposed water ice. And the rover itself had a digging apparatus that could scrape away some of the surface and could expose water ice. So we've got water ice and methane. And that's really um, <coughs> the driving force for some of the experiments in the second generation mission to Mars that's supposed to launch in the fall, this Mars Science Laboratory. So part of the payload of that Mars Science Laboratory, and that's this speaker guy here. Here's the rover. See it kind of does count and hang out for a long time. This is all shiny and new because it hasn't left yet. <laughs> This thing, part of the payload, is um, the ability to measure the stable isotope ratios of methane. And the stable isotope ratios of methane are different in methane from a geological source and a biological source. So this is, back to my initial question, this is probably the first opportunity that we'll get to detect life indirectly. These other planets that I talked about, they're kind of in the queue in NASA, and I think Europa is next, but that's 2020 to 2025. So our ability to detect the presence of life elsewhere is fairly constrained by NASA missions. Now, what we'd like to do is just take a chunk of Mars, bring it home, see if there's happy microorganisms in it. But, you know, there's a problem with that. I don't know if you guys remember this. Uh, this is a uh, 
from a movie made from Michael Crichton's first book, The Andromeda Strain. So the Andromeda Strain and the satellite returns to Earth. It has extraterrestrial microorganisms on it that um, cause blood to clot or cause insanity or something. But, you know, that, that's a, a little, maybe a little far-fetched, but I think planetary protection is definitely an issue, and we want, and, and I don't think that's, it's not an issue. Mars sample return, as we call it, has not been resolved. Where do we actually, how do we treat those samples? Where do we take those samples to? Are we going to like take them to the moon and check them out first? <laughs> you know, that's, that's actually a good suggestion. What about outside our solar system? How do we approach applying this zone of habitability, these constraints like liquid water, beyond uh, our solar system? And that's really the emphasis of the Kepler mission. And so the Kepler mission, what's on this craft, I guess you could call it, is a photometry a really fancy instrument that measures light. light. And you know, we've been, you know, good light there, it's going out. And what the, this mission is to look for Earth-like planets beyond our solar system in the cluster of stars, just a cluster of stars within the Milky Way that our sun's located. And so uh, the way Kepler goes at uh, establishing whether there's Earth-like planets that are orbiting other stars is really a technique that you, that's been used from planet Earth for some time in looking at the flux of light and the changes in the flux of light that are caused by or imposed on the light by an orbiting body. Okay? So as this is planet, it was in front of the star, it changes the light flux. And this is data here. And this is a transit, okay? The planet in front of the star, and, and uh, you can see this dynamically. Actually, the Kepler sign has a lot of nice little gifts and stuff. Interested, and so you can see this kind of dynamically. And what you can tell from this, from from the period, you know, you can tell the orbit. You can tell if it's a regular orbit. You know, we have a regular orbit that helps our temperature not fluctuate a thousand degrees. That's important if we want to find a planet that has a habitable zone that overlaps the Earth's habitable zone. And, you know, so this is the objectives of the Kepler mission. And like I said, one piece of information that you can get from this type of experiment is the period uh, and the regularity of the orbit. But then also you can get uh, information about the distance of the body from the star and the density. And you know, our planet, uh, planet Earth, it's a rocky planet with a defined distance from a star, the star, you know, the sun, uh, which is a star of particular size. And so all that information uh, has to be combined together, the size and intensity of the star, the size and the density of the body, and the distance from the star, and whether the orbit is regular to see if it has a, a, a a stable habitable zone that overlaps with the Earth's habitable zone. Now the Kepler mission has been going on for some time now and uh, data has been pouring in and we've got a lot of data on these stars or on these planets that are close. And this is actually a, a, a study that was done prior to the Kepler mission really kind of laying the groundwork which was some re results from uh, observations in the Keck microscope in Hawaii that has identified one of these planets that are within, or a planet within the uh, habitable zone of Earth. And they've been referred to as these Goldilocks planets because they're, you know, not too hot, not too cold, they're just right. 
uh, just right in terms of providing an environment, an environment suitable for life as we know it, or life on uh, planet Earth. And so, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the Kepler mission has been going on for some time now, and, and the data is pouring in with multiple observations uh, of planets of this type. Good. As you can see from my talk, astrobiology research takes us to the far reaches of our planet and, and beyond. And for me and my colleagues here at MSU, it's, it's a real privilege to be able to participate in this research. It's exploration uh, at its finest. I'd just like to end here with uh, some words from Carl Sagan. And Nobody says it better than Carl. 